specific of hydrogen and deuterium gas in metal organic frameworks. The authors are Christopher Pierce, Sujoy Bhattacharya, Ben Lenberger, and Stephen Fitzgerald, Department of Physics and Astronomy, Oberlin College. And Chris is going to give the presentation. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start just by trying to give a quick uh, definition of quantum sieving in a nutshell. Um, you probably all heard of or are familiar with or are more familiar with than me uh, with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. One of the consequences of this uh, principle is that when a particle is confined in a potential well, as you see here we have a simple harmonic oscillator, it can't, pos it can't exist in a state uh, with an energy at the base of the well. But instead there's a, a finite ground state or uh, zero point energy uh, that is the minimum energy that it's allowed to have by the uncertainty principle. So quantum sieving is essentially when we see two uh, species, in our case we're going to look at hydrogen and deuterium, who are bound in approximately identical potentials and are classically identical, differ by some property that causes their ground states to differ. Um, in our case we're looking at mass. Uh, so we're going to look at this uh, phenomenon inside uh, metal organic frameworks, which I'll explain a little bit about in a minute, where hydrogen and deuterium gas is trapped, uh, adsorbed to the surface. And we're going to find that uh, deuterium possesses a lower ground state energy and hence is more tightly bound to the surface. So first I'll go over uh, MOFs or metal organic frameworks, what they are. Uh, we'll go through a theoretical description of the phenomena of gas adsorption and quantum sieving in a little more detail. The experimental methods we use to probe these phenomena. Uh, the results and conclusions we've drawn from our data, and then I'll try to motivate some further work in this, in this field. Uh, so MOFs are a novel class of nanoporous materials. Uh, that means that they have large cavities uh, from a crystallographic point of view on the order of tens of atoms wide. Um, they've been investigated primarily in their uh, potential use to adsorb hydrogen gas and store it for use in a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. And also they've been uh, looked at in uh, the possible uh, separation of carbon dioxide from other atmospheric gases. Um, there's also a host of other potential gas separation applications and we're investigating separating hydrogen and deuterium here. In particular we looked at uh, MOF 74 which you see here and here. It's made of these helical rods of metal oxide clusters which are linked uh, via benzene rings to form this honeycomb type lattice. Um, this is uh, from some neutron diffraction data. These green uh, dots here correspond with the specific sites where hydrogen and deuterium tend to bind, uh, with the number indicating the relative uh, increasing, uh, rather decreasing, uh, the, the one is the most tightly bound site, and they uh, decrease in binding energy as you uh, go into the center of the pore. This is a unique material and then it can be made in an isostructural series and what that means is you can change the metal that's used uh, to create the framework while the structure remains virtually identical. So it allows you to isolate the effect of metal choice on the absorption of gases. Um, so, so to get at the ground state energy of hydrogen and deuterium and its mass dependence, we first have to sort of consider the energy spectrum. And it's easy to do that by de decomposing the motion of the hydrogen and deuterium gas into these uh, types of motion. So we have the internal vibration rotation about the center of mass, and then the translation of the whole molecule relative to the surface. And this is what we're uh, claiming is the largest uh, factor contributing to the difference in zero point energies of the hydrogen and deuterium gas. So how do we sort of get at and characterize this energy spectrum? We use infrared spectroscopy. I don't have much time to go into this, but these are, this is uh, the infrared spectrum of adsorbed hydrogen. Uh, in each MOF 74, uh, for each metal in the series that's been collected in Professor Fitzgerald's lab over the last few years. Um, we study pure vibrational transitions, um, but we also study uh, transitions where uh, we're exciting it from the ground state and vibration to the first excited state and vibration as well as the first excited state and translation. So the take home message is the difference in these bumps corresponds with um, the spacing of the translational motions energy levels from which we can deduce the ground state energy. And for that we use a very simple three-dimensional simple harmonic oscillator model. Here's a little cartoon picture of um, our energy levels. Uh, if you're familiar with the quantum harmonic oscillator in three dimensions, the ground state is three halves h bar omega, where omega is the classical spring frequency, and these energy levels are uh, separated by uh, energy of h bar omega. So for hydrogen and deuterium, we're saying, we're calling the k 
at this spring constant, effectively the same for the two, then we're attributing the difference in zero point energies to the mass. So what happens when we throw D2 on this graph? You can see you have more closely spaced energy levels and that the ground state is lower so that the difference between this ground state here and the free molecule is greater, which amounts to a higher binding energy. Um, using statistical thermodynamics, we come up with an expression to relate the amount of the species that's absorbed inside the lattice uh, to our state variables that we control. So here theta represents uh, the amount adsorbed uh, over the total number of adsorption sites. P is the pressure above the adsorbate. And this P naught is a thermodynamic quantity, which I won't get into, but it's basically a function of the energy levels of the adsorbed and gas phase molecules and the volume and temperature uh, of the system. Um, so there's a couple different ways we can quantify this difference in zero point energy. We use a ther thermodynamic uh, expression called the isosteric heat of adsorption, uh, which is the log of pressure uh, versus temperature uh, for a fixed N where N is the amount adsorbed. Um, and that's uh, basically the change in enthalpy when the molecule is adsorbed. And it's a good measure of the binding energy, which we'll use to get a good uh, estimate of the difference in the binding energies of the two species. Uh, so basically, we've used our, our data to, in, and I'll show you in a little bit. So at a given pressure and loading and temperature, we compute this derivative to come up with this. Uh, it's essentially a measure of how the adsorption changes with temperature. Um, another sort of more straightforward way to look at it is just simply N here being how much D2 is absorbed and being how much hydrogen is absorbed. Just take the ratio as a function of temperature and pressure. And you'll see how that looks. So our experimental method is the adsorption isotherm, which I'll illustrate in a moment. We've conducted this over a broad temperature range to get a good sense of the uh, isosteric heat. It's conventional in literature to just do it for two temperatures. Uh, but we're getting, be uh, we think, better uh, statistical error by having a broader, probing a broader temperature range. We use a closed cycle helium cryostat to uh, get things cold and an automated Sieverts apparatus to, uh, to actually do the dosing of gas onto the sample. Um, just a quick note, all, all these samples, because they're able to bind really non-reactive gases such as hydrogen, are highly air sensitive. Uh, so if any water or oxygen molecules wander in, they're going to block the sites which we want to stick hydrogen in. Um, and in some cases, it can destroy the lattice. So we have to work in inert conditions. Um, so here's a cartoon picture of the adsorption isotherm. The first thing we do is determine these two volumes uh, as best as we can using helium gas. We'll call this the load volume, and this is the sample volume, uh, which has some metal organic framework in it and is cooled to some uh, uh, temperature which we've measured. So we load this to a certain pressure and measure the pressure to the best of our abilities. Then we open this gauge. At first, the gas freely expands into the cold volume containing the sample. As we continue to approach equilibrium, more and more uh, molecules are, are trapped inside the metal organic <laughs> framework. Until we reach equilibrium, the pressure has then dropped lower than it would have if it was just an empty box of the same volume. And from then that, we can deduce the amount that's absorbed uh, to the lattice as a function of the final pressure in the load uh, chamber. So we can determine the equilibrium concentrations of the adsorbed and gas phases. Um, so what does our data look like? This is a func the amount adsorbed as a function of pressure for various temperatures throughout the presentation. D2 will be in red and H2 will be in black. Uh, we weren't sure if this effect was going to be big enough uh, to see, but as you can see, deuterium is adsorbed in larger quantities for all pressures and temperatures than hydrogen. Um, so uh, this is our, our plot of isosteric heat. Um, I should note the lines intersecting these points are from fitting to that Langmuir model, which uses a uh, few parameters. Um, we computed the isosteric the data you just saw, and this is for the iron-based MOF and cobalt-based MOF as a function of the amount adsorbed. And you can see these are in kilojoules per mole. We're seeing a difference in zero-point energy of around a kilojoule per mole uh, for these two materials. Um, here's uh, something that kind of confirms qualitatively our, our simple harmonic oscillator model. You here see the translational mode we measured using the infrared versus the zero pressure selectivity, which is in the low pressure limit, just the ratio of the concentrations of D2 and H2. And there's clearly other factors going on. This, this black curve represents what we would predict theoretically just from our simple harmonic oscillator model. But you can see these are really high selectivities. And in fact, um, 
uh, in a recent review article on quantum sieving, I think the highest selectivity they could come up with at 77 Kelvin, which is where we're at, was uh, 1.3. And we're, we had nickel before at around three, uh, between 3.5 and, and 4. And actually, just this morning, we pulled in another run, and we got uh, around 5. So this is actually probably going to be some of the higher selectivities of any material um, in this temperature range. Um, so here's the last sort of plot I'll show. This is selectivity of cobalt MOF, but we're instead looking at it as a function of pressure and uh, uh, temperature. So what this would say is if you wanted to actually go and do a practical hydrogen deuterium separation scheme, which is a relevant industrial application, you, you can get huge selectivities here, but at a very impractically low pressure. So you'd have, it'd take forever. Um, so you want to do it at higher, higher pressures, and that's what one would begin to work that out with. Um, we had a lot of error due to pressure uh, measurements primarily, but this is showing our reproducibility. The black and green are two hydrogen isotherms. The red is deuterium. So that's just a confirmation that our effect is real and larger than our noise. So in conclusion, the primary sites of MOF 74 act as a quantum sieve. Uh, the selectivity does qualitatively follow the mass dependence we would expect. And uh, particularly nickel MOF 74 may be actually a practical industrial separation uh, tool for uh, separating hydrogen from its uh, isotope deuterium. Um, further work is to improve the model and sort of uh, understand the other effects that contribute to the selectivity. Um, we're going to start performing actual gas separation experiments where we have a 50-50 mixture and try to measure the equilibrium uh, ratio of the species with um, mass spectrometry. And most uh, isotope separation uh, schemes also exploit kinetics, which we, we hope to start looking at as well. Thank you. We know that there is a slightly different spring constant, but I think the mass effect uh, predominates. Um, it goes as the, the difference in the polarizability between the two species, since we're dealing with mostly van der Waals interactions uh, of adsorption. In fact, we recently found a paper uh, which was looking at hydrogen and deuterium adsorbed on graphite, and then also at CH4 and CD4. And actually, CD4 had the opposite uh, mass dependence. And they're saying that in that case, the polarizability is a, a bigger factor than the change in mass. And it's actually a smaller change in mass. You know, we, we're doubling the mass here. And the polarizabilities are pretty comparable. So it's a simple model, but I think it's a good sort of first step in identifying the mechanism of se separation. Hey, no other questions. Thanks.